Hello all and welcome back to the corner. My knowledge on PS2 hard drive loading is already out of date. Previously I had stated, To me it's just inconvenient when you compare them to the Wii and OG Xbox loaders. So the PS2 basically requiring Windows or maybe Linux in some cases, it's kind of irritating. Well that review aged like fine milk and now not even a month later has it all drastically changed. Thanks to the efforts of Grim Doomer and with cooperation from the OPL team, not only is the internal hard drive device usable as a block storage device, but XFAT has now supported file system too. But what does this all mean? Well previously, if you're going to use the internal hard drive, you'd need to have formatted it to APA, the PS2's native file system, before you could use it. And then to add games to the drive, you'd either need to use homebrew tools or tools that were typically Windows only. And whilst OPL could load games from a USB drive or a network share, I had stated previously that I wanted it to be portable and... I prefer to use a hard drive in the PS2 as then I can take my console with me and not worry about an extra thing or having no games on there. But now you can format the internal hard drive to XFAT and OPL can use it to load games from. And why am I so hyped about it? Well because XFAT, while starting out traditionally as a Microsoft's only file system, has now become an open standard with support in Windows, macOS and Linux. So now any computer can be used to add games to the PS2 and it's as simple as dropping the ISO files onto the drive. Now you could already use a USB hard drive to play ISOs, but again, I have a 40 megabyte a second hard disk drive right there. So being able to use this without extra fluff is absolutely awesome. And of course, I just had to update. Now the first thing to do is to remove the old HDD drive. Now again, previously I'd stated, In this case, it doesn't matter whether you get a SATA free HDD or an SSD installed, it's still going to be limited to ATA 66 speeds. So why am I adding an SSD here? Well, you won't get any faster speeds with one, but after reading through a lot of other users' posts in various places and their opinions on the matter, I'd completely forgotten that seek times would still be less and of course, SSDs are silent. And that brings me on to the other thing that's bothered me. That fan, it's just so noisy, and I don't like it anymore, and it's gotta change. So I will be fitting a silent fan in its stead. Now there's many considerations that I had to make when I was looking at what option to take to replace the internal fan, such as going with a fully internal, or whether I should just use an Octra fan. And looking on Fingerverse, there's many brackets that you could choose from to facilitate the silent fan mod. But in the end, I settled on Proxy's design for using a 60x60x15mm fan as I wanted a fully internal design to not change the stock look of the PS2. As for the fan itself, well, I'll be using a Gelid Silent 6 fan. It offers good flow rate and it's a respectable noise output for the size and it's fairly priced in my opinion. Sure, it's not quite as good as a 60mm Noctua, but I couldn't fit one of those due to the size constraints as Noctua don't actually make a 15mm fan of this size. I wanted to tackle the fan first as it's going to be the hardest thing to do, which means we're going to need to open up the PS2. And a warning, do not open the lid without removing the AC cord to the console as when you do open the lid up, the internal AC to DC power supply is the first thing you'll see. And trust me, I've already been stung by this console many years ago, it's not fun and it can cause you serious injury. Now I was hoping that the fan would just lift up and out once I'd moved the DVD drive out of the way. However the wire is preventing me from fully removing the fan, so I guess we'll just have to take it all apart. Now before I do that, I'm going to remove the switch panel as it's very easy to damage that ribbon cable. Don't ask me how I know. Afterwards, I removed the PSU and I went to remove the DVD drive before thinking... I'm about to feel real stupid, aren't I? Yep. Yeah, so unlike a lot of other consoles, this model of PS2 is assembled on both sides of a supporting frame. So you get the PSU and drive on one side and then the motherboard on the other side. And you need to remove that bottom cover to get access to the motherboard. Now I wanted to remove the entire motherboard from the frame for a couple of reasons. And one is that to get to the real time clock battery, you have to remove the motherboard. But once the motherboard is removed, the fan just falls right out. 
You can see with the 3D printed adapter that the fin fits nicely into the PS2. But a new problem has emerged with this project, and that's the connector. The Jellied 6 fan comes with a PC standard Molux KK254 3 pin connector. However, the PS2 uses a very tiny connector and its fan has very small wires. Originally I was hoping I could just peel back the label from both fans and then desolder the wires for both and change the connectors that way, like you can with this 80mm fan. However, both the PS2 and Jellied fans make the solder points inaccessible so I had to think of a different approach. Now whilst I could have just cut the wires for both fans and soldered them together, I wanted to see if there's a way of possibly replacing the connector for a more standard one. And just to show the size we're working with, this is a JST XH connector with a 0.1 inch pin spacing, but it's way too tall to fit under the RF shielding, so instead I decided to use a JST PH connector, which will fit in the height given, although I'd probably say something like a JST ZH connector might be better. I took the PS2 motherboard to the soldering bench to remove the old connector, although despite my best efforts, removing the connector ended up charring it due to the heat, and this is even with the hot air gun on a lower temperature just to prevent this. Well, I guess I'm committed to this idea then. I bent the pins of the PH connector down in a 45 degree angle so that I can try to tap them onto the power planes of the original connector. Yeah, as you might be able to guess, I don't really recommend you do this unless you're either mad or bored, like me. I used a tiny piece of component lead to join the connector to the exposed ground pad and then I was done. Simple, really? And yes, the RF shield still fits and no, I don't need to insulate it as everything is safely away from the metalwork. All that was left to do was to cut the fan leads after I totally uh, made sure which uh, one was power. Then crimp on a new PH connector. I'm using a pair of Engineer PA24 crimping pliers and for small connectors like the JST connectors I totally recommend using them for this task. I connected the fan to a 12 volt power supply just to check that I had the leads crimped on not only in the right wires but also in the right polarity. And before I went to the trouble of reassembling the entire console, I put the motherboard back onto the tray and connected the PSU and cables up to test the fan. As you can see, I did not have the AC cord connected to the power at any point until my hands were safely away from the console. Cool, it works! Well with the fan working, all that's needed to do was mount the fan into position, and for some reason I had it in my head that I wanted to put the fan filter back in, which meant unclipping and removing the metal shield from the old fan, and then trying for ages to get this to fit. Yeah, don't do this. With the fan installed, I put everything back together, save for the top case. I wanted to do just that one final check to make sure that everything was working, including the fan and DVD drive, before buttoning it down for good. And it's still spinning! Phew!
And now time to look at the easy job, the SSD. Now there's nothing to stop me just leaving the SSD hanging in there freely, but we all just know that eventually it would fall out and that just won't do. So I went back to looking on Thingiverse for other people's models and suggestions on the matter, and then I decided to graft two of the better looking SSD trays into my own design. I still want to credit Ferschler and Jimeno for their original designs which had inspired me and also gave me the correct dimensions that I needed to make this work. And a very brief shout out for the very kind Derek for printing these out for me. He told me to be careful with them, and I was. Up until I cracked it. I suppose that's what I get for designing things with thin plastic. This tray has little nubs in it to help hold the SSD in place whilst I screw in the countersunk screws onto the bottom plate. But with it screwed in, now all I need to do is format it and load games onto it. So back at my computer desk, I attached the drive and used Disk Utility to format it as XFAT. You might have noticed that I'm only using a 256GB SSD here compared to the original 1TB HDD before. And the reason for this is simply that I have a lot of 256GB SSDs and I don't actually need 1TB of space realistically. Now Grimdoomer did tell me to make sure that the drive was formatted with 512 byte sectors, which I can check with Terminal by using Diskutil. As we can see, this drive is 512 bytes. My main SSD on this Mac is 496 bytes, and this mode would not work with the PS2. Now this isn't cluster sizes that you would see in Windows format tool, as that's something to do with the actual file system, and some USB to SATA converters apparently force 4096 bytes per sector. My only advice here is to check to how to format your drive with 512 bytes per sector with your particular OS and if needed, just use the internal SATA port of your computer to prepare your drive. Once the drive is formatted and ready to go, all you have to do is create folders for CD and DVD images and placing them into one of the two folders depending on what the original disc was. When the file copy is finished and the drive is unmounted, we can then install the SSD back into the PS2. And there we are, the updated PS2 with a silent fan mod and with an SSD with XFAT and games in ISO format. Now that the hardware mods have been done, I have to update the software. Turning on the PS2 we... Um... <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> what the hell? I tried a fresh install of Freemac Boot just to make sure it wasn't any of my settings that was causing this particular glitch. But as you can see, it was clearly something that I did. Do you ever feel like time just flies by? Ah, yeah. So remember when I said I wanted to change the RTC battery? Well I did, and what has happened is that the real time clock circuit was reset. So whilst I was expecting the clock to be wrong, I did not expect it to be going at light speed. Anyway, with the clock sorted, I used a USB drive to transfer Grim Doomer's updated PS2 loader with XFAT support onto my Freemac Boot memory card. I opted to replace the existing file as this version still supports APA formatted drives should I decide to go back to the original configuration. After that, you'll need to go into OPL's menu to enable block devices or BDM games by setting the start mode to auto. You'll also need to enable HDD in the Block Devices tab, but once you do that, you should see your games listed in the HDD section of the loader. Now you remember my customised theme and game art? Well, all of that got removed because the theme and artwork was stored on the HDD, and as we've changed the HDD to an SSD, it's no longer there. But like before, you can still install these to the HDD, although you can't use ULaunch Elf to modify the HDD as it doesn't support XFAT. However, as literally any computer can work with XFAT, this is trivial to sort, even if it meant removing the drive briefly. And once the themes and the artwork has been copied across, I set the path for the theme in OPL and it all worked as it did before. Now I had originally complained that I didn't like having to remove the drive every time I wanted to add games reliably, but like with ULaunch Elf, most PS2 homebrew will not work with the XFAT drive, so I've completely removed the option to remote manage my games. 
This also means that you can't use HDD, OSD or free HDD boot as both require the drive to be in the APA format. And from what I gather, games like Final Fantasy XI will just not work with a hard drive like this. So whilst I have game convenience, for the moment the trade-off now is that games and homebrew cannot use the drive and I need to remove the drive to add more games. But given that I'm just using the file browser of the OS and ISO files, I'm completely fine with that. For now, my PS2 is just as friendly to add games as it is with other consoles, and I'm happy with that.